how everything is right. Um, we were saying that we're going to study the evolution of a system, the typical case of a very, very, very simple sample in an NMR uh, experiment. The experiment consists of studying the spectrum of sparkling water, which is water plus CO2. And we are going to study the carbon-13 spectrum. So there, has, there is only one type of nuclei, the nuclei of carbon atoms, and all of them are of the same type. So this, uh, the, from the organic chemistry point of view, this is a very, very trivial example. But it's interesting to illustrate how can we preview the evolution of the state of the system by using uh, the evolution operator and the density matrix formalism. <coughs> First, um, well, we are given the interaction Hamiltonian of the nuclear speed with an applied magnetic field that is assumed along the z-axis, which is the standard assumption in NMR. And the Hamiltonian, the spin Hamiltonian, we are going to study only the nuclear spin state. Um, nuclear spins <coughs> are very isolated inside the molecule. That means that, for instance, the interaction between nuclear spins is not very strong. And all the intermolecular interactions are only weakly filled, very weakly um, felt by the nuclei, because the nuclei very well protected by the inner shells of electrons or the valence shells of electrons. And so it's a very good approximation to treat the nuclei as the only particles in the system. And the effect, well, of course, there can be interactions between nuclei, and this is taken into account by coupling, by coupling between angular moment of different nuclei. And the interaction with the rest of electrons is taken into account by inserting here a, a zero magnetic ratio that includes the screening constant, which is a parameter that take, takes into account the effect of the uh, of the surrounding electrons as a modifier of the cape of the magnetic field. Well, uh, this is easier to see by by putting the equation. That's the magnetic field that a nucleus I uh, feels, and can be put as an as the applied magnetic field. Well, in fact, these are vectors plus some constant, some screen constant, times the applied field. This is the, well, this is in fact the effective field caused by the surrounding electrons. And the effect is to modify the real applied field by a very small quantity, because this parameter is around normally 10 to minus 6 or 10 to minus, minus 5. And so the effect of the electrons is in a certain way to modify slightly the applied field. And so at the end, we can study a system of nuclei, forgetting about all the particles, all the electrons in the system. Well, so when in classical electromagnetism, when we have a magnetic moment, a magnet in a magnetic field, the interaction energy, you know, that is the scalar product of these two vectors. And uh, since we have taken P in the Z direction, then the scalar product is the Z component of the magnetic moment times the modulus of the magnetic uh, field. And the zero magnetic ratio is defined as the proportionality constant between uh, magnetic moment and 
angular model. In this case, nuclear in angular model. Well, normally, we defined omega as the product of gamma P0. And so, well, as minus the product, it depends. Sometimes defined as a positive quantity, sometimes as a negative. If we take this negative definition, uh, equations are simpler in a certain way as well. Then um, we reduce here omega, and then we have the, the simple expression for the Hamiltonian. Um, well, we're going to first This, I, I didn't take the, the I solve this exercise. Not okay. I, I thought this was the exercise of the. <laughs> maybe not. Okay, no, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not the exercise of the mixed state. This is an exercise to see the evolution of uh, of a pure state. So the exercise. For the mixed state will be left for next day. <laughs> Sorry. This is to study the evolution of a pure state. Let's consider that one of the that um, we consider a particular nucleus in the sample that is in a certain time at a given state. This will be the, the initial state, and we are going to study its evolution. Mm -hmm. Well, first we are asked to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation to obtain the energies of the stationary spin states of the nucleus of any nucleus in the sample. Uh, well, this is rather trivial because the Hamiltonian is a trivial function of the Z component of the angular spin momentum. And so to solve it is straightforward if you, we use the standard basis set alpha and beta that we normally use for electrons. In fact, here we are dealing with nuclei, but uh, it's uh, in one half nucleus. And so we can also use the same notation for the eigenstates of Ix with positive and negative eigenvalues. Well, in this exercise, I have used atomic unities. And so the uh, h bar takes the value 1. Well, so the time-independent Schrodinger equation, uh, well, I have not written here, but um, h applied to alpha or beta is omega plus minus one half applied to alpha or beta eh? plus four alpha and minus four beta. <coughs> um, well, uh, then I think the next question was to write the time evolution operator the time evolution operator for time independent Hamiltonians, as is the case, is nothing but the exponential of i h bar divided by Hamiltonian divided by h bar, which is 1 p. So this is the, for this particular Hamiltonian, this is the time evolution operator. And then the question is to study the evolution of the state psi plus, which, as in other exercises, in fact, is the is an eigenstate of Sx with positive eigenvalue. Well, uh, we take the state in the origin of time, eh, in the initial time, and then we apply the time evolution operator, operator times the state. Eh, the Session constant is put at the beginning. Then, since alpha is a, is a 
where is um, it's an eigen state of the Hamiltonian or of I Z, it is well in fact this is an operator. It is also an eigenfunction, eigen state, eigen vector <coughs> of any function of it, and so it's an eigenfunction also of this operator. And the eigenvalue is to take the same function for the operator, but put in here instead of the operator the eigenvalue. In this case, it's the value of iz is one half. So this is the eigenvalue for alpha, and changing the sign, we obtain the eigenvalue of beta. Yeah? So the, the, by using the time evolution operator, is straightforward to obtain the evolution of any state vector. If we have it expressed in the basis set of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, the effect at the end is very simple to include here and here the exponentials of minus energy by time, or energy divided by h bar and multiplied by time. Well, with this we can see how is the evolution of the um, angular momentum, and of course, of the magnetic moment. And both are proportional. For instance, x component of the angular momentum well, is the expected value of the operator ix. As usual, we can put it in terms of ladder operators, shift operators, if you prefer. And then we take here this factor together with the normalization constants in both sides. We have 1 over 4. And then we have put here this and this, in the expression of the vector in terms of function of time. Um, then we make the four products, we expand it, and we have, for instance, alpha times alpha, and the constant here is this exponential, and here is the exponential of the negative exponent, but since we have to add a conjugate to take it outside the scalar product, then we have this, the square of this, in fact. Yeah, this two uh, factors becomes the same. And then we have e to the sum of the exponents, which is i omega. Same here, same thing when we multiply beta by beta. Now we have the negative exponential here, positive here, but when we take out of the scalar product, we have to add the conjugate, so then both become negative, and then we have this exponential times beta beta. Since beta beta and alpha alpha are one because they are always assumed normalized. We have the sum of one exponential and the negative exponential of i omega t, and as you know, this is the cosinus of omega t. Same thing for the y component. The only thing is now that the operator has a minus sign here and an i here. But the, the development is quite uh, parallel, eh? and you can check that we obtain similar thing, but with the sinus. And finally, evolution of the z component. Then we use directly the z component, we don't need to introduce ladder operators because we already know that alpha and beta are eigenvectors of this component with eigenvalues one half and minus one half. And here, the term alpha alpha, in this case, these two exponentials cancel out. Yeah, because when we take them out of the scalar product, 
this one has the negative exponent, this one has the positive, and so the product is e to zero, which is one. Same thing when we multiply beta uh, with beta, but uh, in the first case, we obtain one over two, yeah, because we have this term. And in the second case, we obtain minus one over two. So the result is, well, I have nothing, I have said nothing about the cross terms, yeah, because it's rather evident that they are all zero. Yeah, I only take in every product, I only have considered the diagonal terms. For instance, when I multiply this by this, yeah, alpha times scalar product beta is zero because they are eigenstates of some operator or several operators, Hamiltonian, IZ, with different eigenvalues according to theorem one, I think, this is zero. Same for beta alpha. Eh? Well, so the picture is very simple. At the starting time, well, the Z component is always zero, so the angular momentum is always in the x, y plane. At the starting time, sinus zero, cosinus one, so at the starting time, the magnetic moment has this direction, and same thing for the magnet, well, the, the angular momentum and the magnetic moment both lie in the z axis. As time evolves, this component begins to shorter down and this begins to increase because, in fact, the vector begins turning around the z-axis with angular speed omega. Okay? So this angle is omega t. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, and all the times uh, during this evolution on the e zero, this motion is kept. Yeah, this is the, which is called the precession motion around the magnetic field. And this is exactly the same that is obtained on classical grounds, as I told you, I told you in the last class, yeah, for, the, for any classical magnetic moment when we apply uh, magnetic static magnetic. Well, here I, I have put <laughs> the reverse sense of rotation because for the most important nuclei, hydrogen, carbon, the gamma is positive and the omega is negative. So the real direction in the most typical cases in NMR is uh, clockwise, if we look it from upside, and uh, but for positive, yeah, there are also nuclei with negative gamma and positive omega. In the case of positive omega, the sense of rotation is uh, anti-clockwise. Okay. The only difference, as I told you the other day, is that here we have to consider expected values. Uh, they are, the expected values evolve exactly the same way as the corresponding uh, classical properties. That's why in NMR, normally, um, it's quite often used a language which is very different than the language typically used in other Techniques. Normally, when we study in quantum mechanics uh, some spectroscopic technique, we, we study the evolution of, um, of the system between quantized energy levels and uh, the absorption of a photon, for instance, consists of a jump from one level to an upper level. And uh, apparently, this has nothing to do with the kind of reasoning that you can you can find in an organic chemistry book, for instance, when they speak about NMR. Well, 
in the third volume of my book, both treatments are shown to be equivalent. So at least if coupling is not important, they are exactly equivalent. Uh, coupling complicates somewhat things, and there are some aspects of NMR that when there is the devolution, is um, evolution due to coupling can lead to situations that cannot be studied on classical grounds, and the only way to study it is by using the density operator formalism. Mm -hmm. That's why in advanced NMR uh, books, uh, they always use uh, the operator, the statistical operator or density operator formalism. Mm -hmm. Well, um, last point. There is a funny thing here. That is, of course, we have seen that the, the magnetic moment or the mag angular moment turn with an angular speed omega. But let's have a look to what happens to the state vector itself. Let's calculate the state vector at time 2 pi divided by omega, which is just the period of the period, comma. I mean, there's a period, no? <laughs> the period of the motion, of the circular motion. Um, uh, the period is the inverse of the frequency, and the frequency is omega divided by the by 2 pi. And so the, per, the period is 2 pi divided by omega. Ah. Well, we substitute here. We put time equal, equal uh, 2 pi divided by omega. And since there is a 2 dividing here, we obtain e2 minus i pi. And here, e2 minus uh, plus i pi. But both are minus 1. So we obtain the same original the initial state vector, but with the sign changed. And only if we make two turns around, if the, the angular momentum, for instance, makes two turns around the zeta axis, then we recover the original state vector. If we, if we put here 4 pi divided by omega, then we have here 2 pi, 2 pi, and e to 2 pi is 1. And so that's uh, somewhat strange yeah, that uh, the, the in physically, the only thing that happens is that the properties, the spin properties of the system, turn around angular speed omega, but the state vector itself needs to turn to go back to the origin. But this is this way. And mm, although we often say that the sign is not relevant from a physical point of view, normally the sign of the wave function, the state vector of the wave function, which is equivalent, uh, is not relevant, but this sign can be found experimentally. By interference uh, experiment, we can verify that this sign really exists. For instance, um, these kind of experiments have, have been done by making neutrons interfere. Yeah, so. Uh, but this is an experiment that will be discussed in the last classes, um, but the idea is very simple. Let's zoom here. <clears throat> well, <laughs> awesome. um, well uh, for instance, we have a beam a beam of neutrons that goes to some barrier 
that has 50% of making particles. Well, the barrier should be same. The particles, some of them go through the barrier, and some of them uh, are reflected by the barrier. And then we make them go to a screen, and we detect the particles. Yeah, this is a typical experiment to a study. This is quite equivalent to the two-slit experiment, in which we have a beam of particles that go through two slits, and they interfere. And here, we obtain the typical interference pattern. Same thing here. But if this trajectory is larger than the other one, for instance, if the upper one is some, is some larger, then the particles are longer time traveling, and so the exponential term um, becomes different. Eh? You know that in stationary states, the state vector eh, is this term that depends on time, energy divided by h bar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Times the function of the spatial coordinate. And for longer times, this term changes. And if it changes uh, in a different uh, quantity in one path or in the other, then at the end, we can have uh, that the functions that we join here have different sign. And same thing can be done by inserting here a magnetic field that make the particles evolve as we have obtained here in the, in the, in the exercise. And so by making them go through a, a magnetic field, we can change this phase vector uh, phase term, and uh, in particular, we can make a change in the sign. And so, such differences of state vectors that only differ in a sign or, in general, in a phase, a phase is nothing but a complex number of modulus one. Mm -hmm. This can be observed, can be studied from a experimental point of view with this kind of interference experiments. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is verified that we need to wait until two turns of the magnetic moment are made so as to obtain the original state vector. It's a curiosity. Well, let's <clears throat> go on. <clears throat> so, for next day, uh, try to solve is exercise, which is uh, same time of type of problem, but now we are considering a more real, a realistic situation in which we don't know the state vector of any of the nucleus in the in, of the nuclei in the sample, and the only way to describe the state of those nuclei is by using a density operator. But even then, we can study which is the the magnetic uh, moment at the starting time. And then, normally, when we make uh, the experiment, we take the sample, put it in the spectrometer, and wait for time until it, reach, it reaches the equilibrium, the thermodynamic equilibrium. And then we know which is the starting point. We can use Boltzmann law to write down the density operator. And from this operator, we can study the evolution when we applied only the magnetic field, when we superpose a radio frequency, magnetic field, which is called the pulse of radiation. Then we wait another pulse, and all these sequences can be perfectly followed by starting from the equilibrium operate, the city operator and then applying the evolution corresponding to the different Hamiltonians we are applied by different 
magnetic fields, in fact, were applied. Um, okay. Uh, try to do it uh, for next day, and then we we will discuss it. Okay. Let's go on. Well, this is a very simple exercise. Eh? Uh, since you have many days, you have a week of holidays, <laughs> then you can try to do it also. And uh, this is only to, to see how things are seen in the Heisenberg uh, time evolution picture instead of the Fredinger one and to see how does the components of the magnetic uh, moment or the magnetic momentum evolve in time. Okay? And uh, let's go on. There was any other? Yes. Well, here we have two exercises. They are very simple. Yeah, only to think about it, you don't have to, to develop any complicated mathematics, I think. <laughs> but mm, these are interesting to, to understand the meaning of the state vectors for the different, in, in a two electron system, the triplet, the three components of the triplet, the singlet state, to see uh, what we know uh, uh, from each component of the angular momentum in, in them. And uh, it's also interesting. If you have time, you can try to solve it, or at least try to understand it and to see how it should work. And we will solve it here afterwards. Yeah, this is more of the same thing. And I think these are the last exercises first in the very large first lesson. Yes. OK. So let's close this. Close. Uh, and let's go to the second. No. Every, everything, the, the foundations are already given, but we're going, what are the usual means of representing state vectors, operators, and so on? Yeah? Uh, how to change from one representation to the other? In fact, this can be useful for some of the, exercise, of the exercises you have from the first part. Mm -hmm. So you have already seen it, but I want to to point out some questions that are that are interesting. Mm, at least when we use non-orthogonal basis sets, because normally we assume that the basis sets are orthonormal, but in fact, atomic basis sets are not orthonormal, and so it has some consequences that are, that sometimes are forgotten, and so I want to. To make draw your attention about them. Well, let's consider what uh, representation. The idea is simple. You know it already from any vector space. If we have a discrete basis set, you know that in Hilbert spaces we always can choose discrete basis sets. Any vector of the space can be expanded in that basis. And the vector of expansion is a linear combination. And it can be written with a matrix notation in which the coefficients are put as a column matrix of numbers, complex numbers. And then the basis set is written as a row matrix whose elements are not numbers. They are vectors. This is a notation that uh, was introduced by Lovedin 
many years ago in the 60s, I think, and I, I found it very useful and it's not very used in quantum chemistry books, but I think it's very interesting to rationalize everything related with representations and so I will use it here. Mm -hmm. The matrix, you know that normally are, are represented by a letter in bold face and I will do the same thing for this matrix which is the basis set and the one. Well, this should be bold face. In the Greek letter is not very evident but this is a normal phi and this is a bold phase phi. Means the set of all the basis. Well, then we say that the column matrix C represents vector psi in the basis phi. You know many examples of these. For instance, if you take the state vector any state vector of uh, one particle system that moves along the, the space, we can use any vector in that space to express it. For instance, we could use the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator, and then any, any state vector, it could be the state vector representing the state of the hydrogen atom, for instance, can be written as a linear combination of eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator. The space is the same. The same. We are dealing with, a, in principle, I consider non-spin, uh, spinless particle. Yeah? We could add the spin, but here is for the case of non-spinless uh, particle. Yeah? And these coefficients can be written as a column vector. And so here. The state vector is Z, uh, well, N uh, for the harmonic oscillator, every N takes the values 0, 1, 2, 3, any uh, integral number including 0. And then if we put all these coefficients in a column, this is the matrix representation of the state in this basis set. Mm -hmm. We have seen, for instance, also that we can use the typical basis set of the hydrogen-like orbitals or hydrogen-like monoelectron states, including a spin. And uh, for instance, in this basis set, the expression of 1s plus and 1s minus is this one, and so here, for instance, for the 1s plus, the matrix representation of this vector in this basis set is 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, 0, 0, 0, and infinity of zeros. Okay? <coughs> well, uh, when we calculate the scalar product, we can use the components and then we obtain the typical expression of the scalar product. But here we have to make a clear difference between orthogonal and non-orthogonal basis set. In the most general case, if I take the scalar product between two state vectors that are expressed in terms of a non-orthogonal basis set, if we put the sums outside, the coefficients outside, we can take everything outside except this scalar product. And this scalar product is non delta Kronecker. We can call these products Sij. These are, the, in fact, the overlap integrals, what we call normally the overlap integrals for two of the basis sets, and the basis. And uh, in matrix notation, this sum can be expanded in this way. Yeah? It's, and really check that this is exactly the same as this. Yeah? You multiply the matrices. And then by using 
is notation for the matrix with bold phase letters. We have the, the scalar product is C adjoint, the adjoint of a matrix. You already know that is the transpose and complex conjugate, or conjugate, complex, and transpose, that is equivalent. So you have C adjoint, that is the matrix C put as a row matrix and with oh, this uh, mistake here, because we should have here complex conjugates, then the overlap matrix and the other vector, the coefficients of the second vector. Of course, well, and same thing for the modulus of the vector. The modulus, the square of the modulus is the scalar product of the vector by itself. And then you obtain this expression, which is different than the expression that you obtained in the case of an orthonormal basis set. If the basis set is orthonormal, then the overlap matrix, of course, is the identity matrix, eh, because uh, its elements are Kronecker deltas. And then the identity matrix applied to C prime is C prime. And then you obtain the, more, the most useful expression for scalar products in terms of components. Eh? And same for the modulus of the vector. Mm -hmm. For instance, this is why when you make, say, a Hartree-Fock or DFT calculation, and you look at the coefficients of the eigenvectors of the Fock or the Hohenberg-Kohn or Kohn-Sham operator, you can find coefficients that are larger than, than one. Yeah? If the basis were orthonormal, all the coefficients should be less than one, because the sum of the squares should be one if the, vector, if the orbital is normalized. But in practice, you can find coefficients that are very large. In, if you use very large basis set, and you look, for instance, at the, at the vir virtual orbitals, you sometimes find very large coefficients. And that's because the sum of the squares has not to be one. It is this what has to be one. And S, S can be, can, can have the elements of S can be <laughs> positive, negative, large, or small, complex. So this is, hmm, difficult, very difficult to relate with the value of individual coefficients. OK. <clears throat> uh, what about operators? If I choose any basis set, a way of representing an operator is, uh, well, to represent an operator is to, to give a rule that is equivalent for knowing the effect of the operator of any base of any element in the space. To know how an operator acts is to know the effect of the operator of any vector. But any vector can be put in terms of basis vectors. And so if we know the, the result of applying the operator to any basis element, then we have defined the operator. So. The result of applying the operator to a basis set is a new operator. And this new operator can be written in the same basis set. So uh, for instance, A applied to psi j is a sum of coefficients. These are the coefficients times the basis elements. I use, well, no, this vector is i. And uh, here I put two indexes, one to indicate which is the vector onto which we are applying A, and the other one to indicate which term of the basis set we have here. And so the collection of all those coefficients for any i is a square matrix. And we can say that this square matrix represents the operator 
A in this basis set. This can be written by using, in a more compact way, by using matrix notation. For instance, here I have the operator applied to that row matrix that I have introduced just before, which is a row matrix whose elements are vectors. This is, in fact, the equivalent to write this. That means applying A to every element of the basis set. And the result can be put in as the row matrix times the square matrix of coefficients that we have introduced here. To check that this is equivalent, you can take, for instance, this element. This element is the product of this matrix times this column. It's the element i. So you have to take here the column i. And you make the product, and you obtain exactly the same I had here. This is the column i is the sum of the elements j, where j goes from, well, of course, j goes from 1 to the dimension of the space, say n, or say infinity, depends on the problem. OK? This, written in a more compact way, is this equation. Operator applied to basis vectors equal basis vectors times matrix. Okay. I use this uh, special character, kind of italic A, to differentiate this representation for another type of representation that is often used in quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics, which is in general, not equivalent. We will see why. OK. Uh, well, we have seen several examples. For instance, we know that the S plus, the ladder operator, the upwards ladder operator, when acts on beta, gives h bar alpha, and when acting on alpha, gives 0. Okay? The similar thing for is S minus. Let's write the matrix representing operator S plus in the alpha beta basis. We let's space. <clears throat> well, um, S plus S plus. Yeah, I'm using this equation. Well, or, or this, which is the expanded version. S plus applied to the basis set alpha beta equal alpha beta times what? When we apply S plus to alpha, we have to obtain 0. So the first column here is 0, 0. And when we apply S plus to beta, we obtain h bar alpha. So we obtain 0. Ah, no. Um, oh. We obtain h bar here and no component of beta. Zero. So check, for instance, s plus applied to alpha is this times this, zero. To beta, this times this, h bar, four multiplied by i. So the matrix representing S plus has uh, zeros and h bar here. 
and uh, you can check that the matrix representing S minus is this matrix. Okay? So, we know how to represent operators and how to represent vectors. One. Uh, well, here we verify that it's straightforward to see what's the result of applying an operator to any vector of the Hilbert space. We write the vector in a basis set, and then we apply A. A is a linear operator that, that can go inside, and when we apply A to say to psi uh, J, to psi i, i, then we have seen that the result is this one. This is exactly this equation. And so, uh, at the end, we have that the, the resulting equation can be written by using matrix notation in this way. This is the product of, uh, well, first, the operator, we have seen that can be written this way. That's the first slide. The operator mm -hmm. any vector, no, sorry, the vector can be written as product of basis times coefficients. So, basis time coefficient. And then we apply A. What we want to show here is that sometimes it's easier to work directly with matrix notation than to bother with individual coefficients and sums you have to take care of the order of the coefficients and so on. This equation is very simply obtained by putting the vector in the basis set and then using this. This is just this, as we saw in the last, uh, in the last slide. So, uh, at the end, we know that uh, we obtain that the result of applying A to any vector is the product of these two matrices. Eh? This is basis set, matrix representing A, matrix representing psi. Mm -hmm. um, let's call psi prime this new vector. Eh? Then psi prime If we represent it, is the basis set times a collection of coefficients C prime. And uh, by comparing, oh sorry, the basis set here, well, ah, it's uh, a little unfortunate that I have used the same letter for the basis set. Ah. Um, yeah, the difference between the general vector <laughs> and the basis set elements is that these are lowercase psi and this is uppercase psi. The difference is that here we have the two straight lines and here we have not them. Not them. In other slides, I have used the letter phi, which is <laughs> Clearly different than this, but here I don't know why I start with this notation, which is not very very confusing. Sorry about it. But so the matrix representing the vector, this new vector in the basis set, in this basis set, is a column matrix C prime. And if we compare 
this. And this, we see that C prime, C prime is A multiplied by C. A multiplied by C. And so, the application of a vector is a new vector whose matrix notation is nothing but the product of the matrix and the vector. What you really uh, already know and you have used it in exercises. Hmm? It's the same thing, put it, put it put in a expanded form. Hmm? Um, well, also, if we multiply this psi prime by another psi, what we obtain is that A, let me see, this, let's change color, too many things here. Well, this in matrix notation is this. No, sorry. Uh, no, the mat the coefficients of this are C prime. These are the coefficients. And then we multiply by psi, whose coefficients are C. And if the basis set were non-orthonormal, we have seen that the, the product, the scalar product, includes the overlap matrix here. Okay? So, let me. System of raising. Very simple. Okay? So, by using, let me see. By using this expression for calculating a scalar product, we apply it here, and we finally found that this, in matrix notation, is this. Again, normally you don't find the S here because normally you use orthogonal vectors, but for a non-orthogonal basis set, you have to take care of including matrix here. When basis sets are non-orthogonal, you have to be very careful with the formulas that are calculated by mean of matrices, because the, there is not a complete parallelism between vector equations and matrix equations. Well, let's see. Okay, let's stop here. Let's say 10 minutes break, and then we will introduce the second type of matrix representations. Oops. If you have any question, and you want to take well, let's. Um, Let's introduce a second way of representing, of obtaining matrix representation of operators. That is the one that, that is usually used in every quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry books. And uh, in fact, it is not as we will see a true representation. But normally, matrix representing operators are defined that way. The matrix element Ji is obtained by applying the operator to basis vector i and then multiplying the result by basis vector j. We obtain, of course, uh, a result. Uh, we, we define this way a square matrix uh, whose elements can be easily related to the matrix elements of the other type of representation we have introduced just before. Because here, 
I can expand this in the basis set. This is sum over k times the basis vector and the coefficients. Yeah, this is this. And then we multiply scalarly by the other, uh, other basis vector. And then here we recognize the elements of the overlap matrix. And so this is nothing but the product of this is yeah, in fact, uh, in an expanded, expanded form, we can write this result in this way. Any element of A, we, we use normal A for this representation, which is the kind of representation normally used in books. So I put a normal A, G, uh, A here, and this is the product of this row times this column, yeah? sum over k, etc., etc., etc. Well, so in a compact way, we can write this relationship between the two types of representation. Of course, if the basis set is orthonormal, the overland matrix is the identity, and in this case, both are equivalent. But for a non-orthonormal basis set, they are different. And I say that this is the true representation, and uh, a scalar product representation is not. Mm -hmm. This uh, notation uh, is is mine. <laughs> I, in fact, is uh, it's uh, strange that this differentiation. Um, I have not found it in quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry book. I I found it in some in a course that Lovdin made in in Sweden many years ago. And my first teacher of quantum chemistry, Dr. Tell, had these notes, and I found them very interesting. And uh, I have rescued them and used it for my classes because I think it's. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, it's important to see the difference between both ways of representing vectors. I say that the first one is the true one, is the true representation, because in mathematics, a representation is defined as a set of matrices that multiply the same way between themselves as the corresponding operators. And as we will see, this type of representation fulfills this requirement, but the standard way of representing operators does not fulfill this mathematical requirement. Well, uh, when we take, uh, well, you can see that, for instance, the identity operator is represented by the identity matrix if we use the true representations, which is trivial from the definition, yeah? if we, if you have here, <clears throat> you, know, you have here that this is the identity operator, then you have here one times the Kronecker delta, and at the end you obtain that this the only living term here is psi j, yeah? and so. The matrix is the identity matrix, but if you use a scalar product for representations, this is no longer true. The scalar product ma matrix representation of the identity matrix is the overlap matrix. Yeah? This is rather evident here. Okay, and if you take, for instance, an expected value in terms of scalar product matrix representations, well, here um, you can use the, in fact, we are using this result. And here we recognize this. And so for calculating expected values, for instance, it seems simpler to use a scalar product matrix representations because in this case 
you don't have to take into account the overlap matrix in the middle. If you use true representations, you need to include the overlap matrix, but this is not needed for the second type of representations. But you have to take care because the difference as we will see, could be important in some cases. Mm. Well, uh, I have included here some very simple exercises that, in fact, are, are rather similar to some exercises you, you are doing these days for the first part. Mm. Uh, the only difference is that in the exercises you are, you are solving now, you always assume that the basis set are orthonormal. And here, the difference is that I have used non-orthonormal basis set in order to see that things are somewhat different. All of them are very, very simple. Eh? Uh, well, you have maybe enough work for these days, but we will discuss them in the, late, in the, days, the days after. Okay. Well, here we have some definitions and some properties that are interesting. We have already used the notion of adjoint matrix, eh, which is nothing but complex conjugate and transposed. And uh, of course, an Hermitian matrix is a matrix that coincides with its adjoint matrix, a similar notion. And we will see that all of these notions are parallel with the corresponding notions with vectors, with operators. But sometimes there are some tricky points for non-orthonormal basis set that should be pointed out. Uh, also, the definition of a unitary matrix is very similar than the as the definition of the of unitary operators, the adjoint coincides with the inverse, and real and Hermitian matrix are symmetric matrix, and real and unitary matrix are orthogonal matrix. These are matrix that in which the inverse coincides with the transpose. Um, this exercise, well, in fact, is a list of properties. Let's, maybe we will prove some of them. Some of them are, in fact, proven in the notes I put in the Moodle, in the notes in Spanish. At the end, there is an, an appendix in which some of the exercises are solved. And some of these, some points in this exercise are solved there. You can have a look. But let's discuss the results because some properties are interesting. First, if you use a non-orthonormal basis set, you cannot use these scalar products to obtain coefficients. It's rather straightforward to see that this scalar product is the result of applying S to the column coefficient matrix. Now, if we have the product of two operators, the same product exists, exists between the corresponding true matrix representation, but not for the scalar product matrix representations. And that's the main reason why I use the word true for this type and not for this type. Um, well, if we have a product of two matrices such that the number of columns of the first coincides with the number of rows of the second, then the adjoint corresponds to the product of the adjoints in the reverse order. Again, similar to a parallel relation that exists for operators. And then a trivial consequence of this is that if, in the same way, well, if an operator B is the adjoint of an operator A, in this case, the same relationship exists with the scalar product matrices, but not with the true <laughs> matrices. Eh? Uh, 
we could consider that the truth is better always. Not always. Eh? In fact, uh, when we are dealing with conjugates, there is a, a close parallelism with this second type of representations. Eh? In operators and this type of representations. And well, a trivial consequence of this is that the scalar product matrix of an Hermitian operator is an Hermitian matrix. Eh? In the case A equal A, then we are led to this conclusion. And finally, the columns of a unitary matrix can be considered orthonormal by using this definition of orthonormality. If we consider that each column represents a vector, the coefficients of a vector in an orthonormal basis set, then the product of two columns uh, is the Kronecker delta. And so, in a certain sense, we can consider that an orthono orthogonal uh, matrix, in fact, has or is a collection of columns that represent orthogonal vectors, if the basis set were orthogonal, because only in this case orthogonality has a, this, uh, such a simple expression. Okay. Well. Um, <clears throat> yeah. A scalar problematic representation of a projector is something that I think also has appeared in your exercises. Can be written that way. Um, a projector has a matrix, a projector onto uh, a unidimensional space, that means onto a basis vector psi r, expressed in a basis set that contains this vector, <clears throat> is a vector having every element zero except of the diagonal element RR. And this can be written as the matrix product of a row matrix, which is in fact the same as the matrix. Oh, sorry. <laughs> This is, of course, the matrix representing this basis vector in its in the in the basis set containing it. Eh? Uh, of course, the matrix that represents this vector has all zeros except the element R. And if you multiply this with its transpose, then you obtain a matrix that has all zeros except this one. So we can say, OK, the gets are represented by column vectors, and the brass are represented by row vectors. And then this product in matrix notation is put this way and gives this result. Okay. Um, more generally, sometimes we will found products which are similar as similar than the, the projectors, but with different elements here and here. And the same rule can be applied. This can be written. The first one can be written is a bra as a row matrix, the second one a get as a column matrix, and if we multiply them, we obtain a matrix made of zeros except in the position R S. So this is the way of expressing this. Of course, we always are considering that the basis set includes these two elements. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, uh, let's consider an orthonormal basis set. 
if the basis set is orthonormal, a way of expressing in any basis set any operator is an expression that is very often found in textbooks. And this is readily obtained by including this resolution of the identity here and here. Yeah, of course, you have to change the one of the two indexes to make the product. And then we obtain here a sum over R and S. And this times this times this is this one is this is, in fact, the scalar product. Well, in fact, if we are consider, considering an orthonormal basis set, both representations are the same. So this is the representation, the only representation of the operator in this basis set. If the basis set is made of eigenvectors of A, this reduce, reduces to the spectral decomposition of the operator. Because then this matrix is the is a diagonal matrix, yeah? and then and then its elements. Well, I have here used the notation with two indexes, one to refer to the eigenvalue, and the second one to differentiate they generate eigenvectors corresponding to the same eigenvalue. And so here, the diagonal element is have the form eigenvalue times two deltas, two delta, two Kronecker deltas, because this vanishes unless both indexes are the same here, well, in the, in the matrix. It's the matrix, this is a way to express that the matrix is diagonal. Ah, sorry. <clears throat> well, then, uh, well, by simplifying the delta uh, allows to eliminate one of the sums, and then we have to put k equal j, and then we obtain this. And since AR is independent on uh, S, it can be, well, also we have a delta here that eliminates the sum over S. And then we can take outside uh, A, outside the sum over J. And, and we obtain here the projector over the eigenspace corresponding to this eigenvalue. And so this, in fact, can be considered as a generalization of the spectral expansion of the operator when we use, instead of the eigenvectors, we use any other basis set. Orthogonal basis set. For the case on, of non-orthogonal basis set, again, the relation is more complicated. I thought it had, maybe I have it in a, in a forthcoming slide, because I think I have put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. The general expression eh, is more complicated when the basis set is non-orthogonal. Orthonormal. Well. What happens if we have if we made a change of basis set? How do the representations change? Well, let's start with vectors. I have an old basis set and a new basis set, and the elements. How how do we define this change? The usual way to define it is to express the new basis set elements in terms of the old basis set. And these are the coefficients. And uh, this equation, again, can be put in a matrix form by writing the matrix of the new basis set, the matrix of the old basis set, and the 
change of basis matrix. If you take this element is this times this, which is nothing but, but this. In compact notation, psi prime new basis set equal old basis set times L. Uh, vectors. Any vector can be expressed in the old basis set represented by a collection of coefficients, a column of coefficients, and in the new basis set also represented by another column of coefficients. If we introduce this here and uh, we use this equation, then we can put the right-hand side term in the left-hand side and take common factor to this matrix, to this row matrix. So we obtain this matrix equation in which this is, in fact, a linear combination of the basis set elements. Because this is, if you Imagine how does this work. This is a matrix, a row matrix, and this is a column matrix. L times C gives a column matrix, and then we make the difference, and again, you obtain a column matrix. So since basis sets are made of linearly independent vectors, the only linear combination that gives zero is the combination in which all the coefficients are zero. So this is zero, and by putting it in the right-hand side, you have the relationship connecting the old and the new representations of the same vector. If the inverse of L exists, then you can multiply here by L minus 1. L minus 1 in both sides, and then L minus 1, L is the identity, and you obtain the expression of C prime in terms of C. Um, if both sets are made of the same number of independent elements, uh, the matrix always exists. Yeah. The only case in which this the, the inverse matrix of L, so the the change of basis can be made in both senses. Of course, if one of the sets has more, is not a true basis set and has less elements than the other, then this matrix is not the, the inverse change is not well defined and then the inverse should not exist. So if you sometimes find that the inverse of a change of basis mass cannot be found, probably that means that the new basis set is not a, a true basis set. Well, mm, well, of course, this also can be applied in infinite dimensional spaces. If you take a subspace, you can apply everything, but always you have to keep the dimension of the of the subspace in order to guarantee that the inverse of L exists. Well, <clears throat> um, sometimes uh, there is a standard basis set yeah, which is maintained along some development some, and then you use several, for instance, you can have uh, an atomic basis set, and then you are changing from uh, canonical Hartree-Fock orbitals to localized Hartree-Fock orbitals, which are two sets of Hartree-Fock orbitals, and both are expressed in the same atomic basis set. In this case, it's interesting to see how the matrices change when you make the change of basis, but using the same underlying basis set to express all of the vectors. For instance, we have two basis sets, psi, no, phi and phi prime, 
and then uh, say atomic orbital basis set. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Um, then <clears throat> the matrix representing, uh, well, the the matrix defining the two sets of say molecular orbitals are those. Hmm? Uh, in fact, this is the change matrix C is the matrix that change from atomic to the first molecular set and matrix C prime defines the second molecular basis set in terms of the same atomic basis. Well, then the transformation from one set of orbitals to the other can be readily obtained from these matrices. For instance, let's assume that this is the definition of the, say, the localized molecular orbitals in terms of the canonical molecular orbitals. You know that the canonical molecular orbitals are the eigenstates, eigen orbitals or eigen spin orbitals of the FOC operator, um, but they can be submitted to unitary transformation, then you obtain, a, for instance, localized orbitals that gave, that give the same as later determinant that are completely equivalent. The global definition of the system, of the electronic system, is exactly the same, but the shapes of the orbitals are very different. And for instance, with localized orbitals, you obtain orbitals that adapt very well to the uh, Lewis structure of a molecule. Yeah, Lewis, Lewis uh, in fact, deduced this kind of representations in a rather empirical way, but in molecular orbital theory, the way of justifying this kind of representation is by, by seeing that the localized molecular orbitals, in fact, are located where Lewis put bonds and non-bonding pairs, inner pairs, etc. Well, let's, uh, this is the matrix that change one set of orbitals to the other, and we express both sets in terms of atomic orbitals. Again, we can put this in the left-hand side, take common factor to the basis element, and same reasoning as before. A linear combination of independent vectors only if zero, if all the coefficients are zero. Um, here, these are square matrices. Yeah, so this zero is not a number, but a row of zeros. Yeah, because here we are considering non one vector, but the whole new and old basis set. Yeah? So here you have, this is something like this, for instance, and this matrix is a square matrix, and then you have a collection of zeros. Yeah? So this time this gives zero and the same of for all of the products, and so all the elements of this matrix must be zero. Uh, sorry. Okay. And then, so putting this in the right hand side, we have the relationship between the new matrices coefficient in terms of the old one, which is very simple. And uh, also, you can, if you have the coefficient and you can to write the transformation matrix between psi and or phi and phi prime, you only have to multiply on the left hand side by c minus 1. If you put here c minus 1 and c minus 1, you obtain that L can be written this way. So you have a way of obtaining the transformation matrix. Okay. 
Um, well, what about transforming matrices? Transforming the matrix representing an, an, an operator. Let's uh, start with the true matrix representations. Yeah, we have a change of basis set defined by a matrix L, and you have the equation that defines the representation in the first basis and the representation in the second basis. Uh, if you multiply here by L and by L and you introduced, introduce here that this is this yeah, by definition of the change of basis and on the right hand side, uh, well, then, no, uh, then we obtain that A, A psi prime is equal to this and also to this. And here we put this instead of this, let me write it because it will be more clear. This is matrix psi and uh, scalar product representation of A. No, this is the true representation of A times L. And on the right hand side, I have the basis set, all the basis set, yeah, times L times a right and so this can be put in the first in the left hand side and take common factor to the basis set and then again the same reasoning the only linear combination that is zero is that having all the coefficients equal, equal zero and so these matrix elements must be all of them zero and then taking this to the other side we have this equation that relates matrices in the two basis set through representation matrices in the old and the new basis set of course l minus 1 should exist and then, for instance, if you multiply this by L minus 1 on the right hand side, then you obtain this. And if you multiply it on the left hand side, you obtain this. So you have the way of connecting the old and the new basis set, or vice versa. Okay? Well, uh, well, this is the relationship we have just obtained. And we are going to see, of course, we have also obtained this. And we are going to see what happens with the other kind of representations, the one we usually use in quantum chemistry. Um, well, this exercise, again, is a collection of properties that are interesting. First, if we have a change of basis, then the overlap matrix changes this way. Yeah? The overlap matrix, yeah, you remember, was the representation, the scalar product representation of the entity operator in the new and the old basis set. To change from one basis to the other, you have to multiply by L plus the left hand side and L in the right hand side. Uh, well, this can be shown by by calculating an element of this S prime and put it put in the new vectors in terms of the old vectors. This is very straightforward to cal to demonstrate by using notation in terms of coefficients. All of the other points in this exercise can be demonstrated 
using only matrix notation, matrix algebra. And I think it's more simple than using coefficients with subindex. So we, uh, well, we will try to do them. You will try to do them. And if not, I will solve them here because I think it's uh, simpler. And it, of course, is much better not to, it's easier not to, to, to make errors if you use matrix notation, which is much simpler than the notation with uh, individual matrix elements. And so, by, it's rather straightforward to see that, for instance, the relationship between the old, between the matrix representing the operator, scalar product matrices, in the old and the new basis set, is very similar to the relation existing for true matrix representation, except for the fact that here we have the adjoint of L, and here we had the inverse of L. So in this case, in fact, this type of matrices are easier to transform, because it's easier to find the adjoint than to find the inverse. Um, well, again, both are coincident if the basis is orthogonal. More properties. When we have a change between two orthonormal basis set, matrix L is unitary. Yeah? Uh, that means that the adjoint coincides with the inverse. And uh, in fact, um, you can use also unitary transformations for non-orthonormal basis set. And then you obtain non-orthonormal basis set, a new non-orthonormal basis set, in which the scalar products uh, are maintained. Uh, unitary matrix preserves scalar products, but the usual way of using it is to transform orthonormal basis set and orthonormal basis set. But only for this type of transformations, matrix L is unitary. In general, it is not. The trace of a true matrix representation is invariant under any change of basis set. In fact, we defined the trace of an operator in terms, the, the trace, in fact, was the sum of the diagonal element of the scalar product matrix representation, because we said the trace of some operator A is the sum of this for any complete set. And uh, this, in fact, are the diagonal elements of the scalar product matrix representation. But it's very easy to, to, to show that the, the true matrix element is invariant under any change of basis set. So we can, if we have the true representation in terms of a non-orthogonal basis set, we can change to an orthogonal basis set and then apply this. And so the conclusion is that for any basis set, true matrix representations can be used to obtain the trace of an operator. If you use a scalar product matrix representation, you have to choose orthonormal basis set, as was indicated in the definition of this trace. But if you use the other type of matrices, no matter the basis set being orthonormal or not, the trace is the same and be calculated with any basis set. Hmm? Well, that's the consequence we have written here. The trace of an operator is the trace of its true matrix representation in any basis set. Now, the trace of a scalar matrix representation is invariant under any unitary change of basis set. If the basis set is unitary, of course, uh, 
<clears throat> what the trace is then preserved. Uh, I don't know if this is so trivial. Okay, think about it, <laughs> and we will discuss it. Okay, so uh, but this is uh, also a very trivial exercise to deal with with these ideas, and let's finally connect this with the diagonalization of matrices and the uh, and the eigenvalue equation of matrices. Let's consider the eigenvalue equation of some operator. Uh, this can be written by this. Here we have a collection of eigenvectors. In fact, we can have here a whole, a complete basis set. And then this collection of equations can be grouped in a single matrix equation, which is this one. A applied to the basis set of its eigenvectors equal the basis set times a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements are the eigenvalue. If you take, the, for instance, A applied to this element, you have to take the product of this row times this column, and this is exactly what we have here. Okay? And so, you can see that, in fact, this is the way we have defined the true matrix representation of an operator. Operator applied to basis set equal basis set times matrix. And so, the diagonal matrix made of the eigenvectors, in fact, eigenvalues, in fact, is the true matrix representation of the operator if we use as basis set the eigenvectors. So, um, well, this is to say that this matrix is diagonal. Okay? Well, um, so the solution of an eigenvalue equation, I mean an operator eigenvalue equation, is equivalent to finding a base, a change of basis that transform the matrix calculated in any arbitrary basis set to the new basis set made of the eigenvectors. That's why Obtaining eigenvalues of operators is equivalent of diagonalizing matrices. Uh, and this is the same. To solve, in fact, uh, this is nothing but uh, if we start with the matrices, the matrix expressed in any arbitrary basis set, and then we found the transformation L that changes from the original basis set to a basis set in which the new representation is diagonal, this change, in fact, as we will now see, gives the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. Of course, the eigenvalues are the elements, as we have seen. And if we, <clears throat> well, this is the this is the expression of how true matrices transform uh, when we make a change of basis set. Mm -hmm. Now this is the old, the base, the matrix in the old basis and the matrix in the new basis, which is diagonal. And this is here written in an expanded form. Yeah. This is exactly the same as this. To see, eh, I have put it to see that, for instance, if we select here one column, we obtain 
matrix applied to this column equal this matrix multiplied by this column. This is what I have put here. And if we make this product, yeah, we obtain, for instance, this times this is this. Yeah. The only surviving term is this one, because all of the other terms here in the matrix are zero. And this matrix is multiplied by AI. And the same for all the other products. And since in all of them we have the same constant here, we can take it outside. And so at the end, we have a eigenvalue equation for matrix A. A applied to an eigenvector equal eigenvalue times eigenvector. So if we use true matrix representations, the eigenvalue equation for some operator translates to an eigenvalue equation for the corresponding matrices. And we can use typical methods. For instance, we can write, uh, put here in the first side, and then this is, in fact, this is a, a linear, uh, a set of linear equations in terms of the, the L's, uh, incognitas, <laughs> or knows <laughs> are the L's, and then this has only non-trivial solutions when the matrix of coefficient has zero determinant, and so you have the secular equation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, you already know how to solve this type of eigenvalues equations for matrices. Uh, well, I have here only to check that everything is consistent. Uh, uh, this is the transformation from old basis to new basis, and any element of the new basis is obtained corresponds to a column of this transformation matrix. So every column of the transformation matrix represents an eigenvector, eh? and so <clears throat> we can identify these vectors with the columns. Well, uh, what happens if we use the scalar product? Matrix represent well. It's uh, five o'clock. Let's uh, stop here, eh? and next day we will see that if we use not the true representation of matrices, but the scalar product matrix representation, then overlap matrices will appear in the equations. And that's why, for instance, Hartree Fock equations put in matrix notations always have some overlap matrix inside. And in fact, if you use this type of matrices, the operator eigenvalue equation is not equivalent to an eigenvalue matrix equation. You have to solve an equation which is no longer an eigenvalue equation because of the existence of matrix S here. Yeah? OK, we, we will come back to this next day. You have any final question? Yeah? And if not, I stop recording. <laughs>